Hey, Sam. Again? Hello, Mayor. All right. Let's get this party started. Welcome, everyone, to the Joint Meeting for Rules and Open Government Committee, Committee of the Whole, uh, for Wednesday, December 2nd. Tony, could you please call roll? Arenas? Here. Davis? Here. Camus? Jones? Present. Ricardo? Present. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's begin with a review of the agenda uh, for December 8th. Start on pages five and six. Are there any changes? On pages seven and eight, pages nine and 10. You know, forgive me, Lee, I think I was supposed to stop. Uh, you, were you gonna insert some information here? Actually for December 8th, I was just gonna say, obviously as you guys go through the agenda together, um, take a look, but the, the we are recommending that this next meeting, the 8th, because we do have a 3.1 and then again on the 15th that we start at 11 a.m. Oh, got it, okay. Here we go. All right, did the meeting start already? Did I miss? Uh, don't worry, there's been no vote yet. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yep, we're on pages uh, 11 and 12 of the agenda for the 8th. And we will be having a 3.1. Yes. On pages uh, 13 and 14. Pages 15 and 16. Uh, pages 17 and 18. Pages 19 and 20. All right, and we have some ads. City clerk's request for a retiree member of the police board. Yeah, it's, to, it's to extend this term. Um, we didn't get an applicant position, so we need to um, go back out and do a new recruitment. Okay. Okay, uh, then we'll go to the public. Mr. Beekman, welcome. Hello, happy Wednesday. Um, life is a lot different than just several years ago, how a community and its government talk about ideas of peace and local open democracy, and not the ideas of war and the local need of national security secrecy. I'm sorry if I do not mention enough, uh, mention it enough, but the future of technology for a city simply can be a, a more shared equal process between community and its local government that most often procures technology ideas for its community future. I'm excited this is a time for of more than just privacy policy ideas to protect internal government practices. This is open public policy ideas, uh, a time of, this is a time of open public policy ideas meant for a whole community to be more openly involved with, to discuss and debate towards a, a shared middle ground. The ACLU has many ideas and guidelines that can work towards a one person and one voice idea of local community democracy at this time. These are ideas of actual democratic equality for a community that perhaps can better develop decades of more open, of more representational corporate forms of democracy, community and its government. It is a good ACLU work that I feel can very much help address new questions of equity and reimagine in local neighborhoods and communities at this time. With 40 seconds left, I wanted to uh, uh, remind yourselves, uh, there was a very interesting public speaker that asked yesterday questions about the future of uh, uh, camera policies and, 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 and how, how that can be relayed uh, to, a, to a board, how can, you used to have a measure T board that you wanted to have some sort of technology public oversight about, about. that didn't work out too well. 
there are boards within San Jose that can talk about oversight issues with technology. I hope we can really address that and, and, and give it a little bit more vibrancy to their work. And uh, Thank you. All right, returning to the committee. Is there a motion? Move approval of the agenda for December 8th with an 11 a.m. start time and including the ad sheet. Second. Second. All right, let's vote. Arenas? Yes. Davis? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Under December 15th, as for any changes to the printed agenda, starting at pages five and six, seven and eight. Nine and ten. Eleven and twelve. Thirteen and fourteen. Mayor, we to uh, manage the agenda staff uh, does have a handful of possible deferrals that we're recommending to help manage the flow of this agenda, stuff that can wait until January. And two of those are on this page, it's 3.3 and 3.7. Okay. 311 Digital Strategy Roadmap and Jeff Lamworth and Nonprofit Transfers. And those would come to the first meeting of January. Okay. Can I ask, is the staff work done on those items or is it, would you need time for that as well? Um, I believe the the 311 digital strategy roadmap could use additional time to my understanding that the measure E work is done. That, that was simply just uh, trying to manage the agenda for you. Okay. Um, so let's talk about that. Let's come back to that as soon as we're done looking at the entirety of the Massive calendar. <laughs> um, so pages 15 and 16. Uh, 7.1 is another uh, recommended uh, deferral to the first meeting of January. I'm just wondering about 4.1. That doesn't seem to be particularly, particularly urgent either, is it? Um, the fine amounts on illegal fireworks? We might uh, do that before the new year. Yeah. Yep, that was, uh, that, that's why we didn't recommend it, to have okay. things in place before New Year's possible. Okay. Uh, pages uh, 17 and 18. Nineteen and twenty. Mayor, the last of the four that we're recommending for deferral is eight point four. Okay, and that would go to the first meeting of January. Right, uh, pages 21 and 22. <clears throat> uh, pages 23 and 24. All right. Um, I'm guessing 10.2 is going to attract a fairly substantial crowd. Is that time sensitive? Sorry, 
So, sorry, Mary, you're breaking up. I didn't hear you. What was the question? I was ask if 10.2 is time sensitive because I imagine there may be a large. Other than again, it, we had it only a few weeks ago. There didn't seem to be that many folks. Yeah, I don't believe it's time. So it hasn't been noticed specifically okay. according to this. Okay. Um, but in trying to start early and, and manage the agenda, we were that yeah. that was part of the reason not having this come up so late. Agreed. And there's going to be a 3.1 report on this day. We do not have one scheduled for okay. the 15th yet. If if something changes and we need to, we could. But um, I would imagine whatever comes down from the state and the county in the coming days will report out on the 8th during 3.1. Okay, that's helpful. I don't think this is an unmanageable agenda anyway. We could probably not even defer some of those things. But um, if, if they're not urgent and we always know there's something that will be, um, as I see it, staff is recommending 3.3, 3.7, 7.1, and 8.4. Is that right? That is correct. Um, Lee, this is Gloria. I think there are some changes in the numbering. I think it's 8.2 that we're recommending for deferral. Oh, I'm sorry. Did, did it get changed when we uh, move yeah. things around? I apologize. Yeah. Um, so it's North Almaden Boulevard vacation surplus and sale. Yeah, that's the one we can move. Isn't that needed for a, oh wait, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, this is correct. Yeah, and it, it would go to the first meeting of January. I see. And this relates to the hotel project, is that right? Yes. Okay, so that would be a two that we could defer. All right. All right, uh, let's go to the public. Mr. Bridgman. Hi, uh, to clarify, uh, I was speaking on item uh, about public, uh, privacy policy items on the agenda of, last, of the last item. On this item, I'm gonna speak of, on uh, this kind of an overall theme of, of COVID issues that I, I thought I could address at this time uh, on this agenda. Uh, the mayor of San Jose in recent public meetings said he's expecting a possible wave of foreclosure issues by the summer of next year. To also mention tenant eviction issues and new recession issues will also be looming in January, 2021. It seems mostly agreed upon that the California state housing forgiveness issues of AB 3088 fell short in what may have been the incredible good efforts of assembly persons like David Chu and Ash Kaur this past summer. I hope we can all be open to new federal funding ideas and how to better develop state of California ideas and funding mechanisms that are now being developed at the state level uh, for the next few years. It is these good efforts that can help uh, buoy the economy for the next few years and in dwindling down uh, COVID-19. Uh, to learn to expand AB 3088 this January, more to its initial housing forgiveness ideas and guarantees is cooperative help for tenants, small business owners, uh, apartment owners, and lo local landowners alike. I think these are the ways that can bring, that can better consider our human creativity and humanity. As it must be considered that COVID-19 is a condition born at the international level and is not the fault of everyday people of a community. And therefore, everyday people should not be held responsible for the debt burden created by COVID-19. It is understanding this concept collectively that is important at this time. Again, to offer Alameda County simply has a good perspective how to understand the future of state funding ideas and then explain this to its communities in honest, straightforward terms. This helps avoid unnecessary harm and hardship for everyday community who can be unsure of these sorts of things. Thank you. Thank you. Right back to the committee. Please request for 11 a.m. start. We make a motion to consider that. Motion to approve the agenda with an 11 a.m. start time. Do we want to defer those four items? Um, sure. Okay, so that was- Sorry, a Tony. Three point. I believe we have an ad sheet for the fifteenth as well, Tony. That you oh. did not show. I didn't see an ad sheet for the fifteenth. Oh. I just had an ad sheet for the eighth. Okay, we may have a second okay. that apple next week. We can fix that next week. Yeah, okay. we can take care of that next week. It's not an issue. So, so uh, I'm going to second, but I want to get a, a point of clarification from from Lee. 
the request for 11 a.m. start time, was that a soft request or a hard request? It was a polite request, a request. council member. A request. Is it yeah. necessary? I, you know, I, we, we've been pushing, obviously we don't have anything planned for 3.1 right now, which makes it a bit easier. We have been struggling with some of the land use items coming up extremely late for our public. Um, and so this was a way uh, to mitigate that. But if we are I mean, doing the deferrals um, and lightening the load without a 3.1, I would say that it's a soft request. All right, you hear that uh, council member Camus? I do, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm fine, you know, especially deferring some stuff on my last meeting, that'd be great. <laughs> well, Councilor Camus, just to be clear, does your motion include deferrals on 3.3, 3.7, 7.1 and 8.2? Yes. All right. And so the other question is, do you still wanna make a motion for 11 a.m. start time or 1.30? We could do the 1.30. I second that. I'm in favor of the 11 a.m. so we don't have to go to midnight. <laughs> That's what Arenas, you wanna weigh in on this? Oh, I'm with Vice Mayor this time, yes. <laughs> All the way. <laughs> okay. Let it be known when the uh, 1130 time is PM is, is rolling around <laughs> that we had our chance. Uh, Mayor, I'm willing. I'm willing to step up and take the grief on the okay. that happened. <laughs> we'll make sure to point out, point you out, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, Mayor, <laughs> maybe what we could do is put the 15 minute mark as a soft mark and not a a, a time limit. I think that helped um, in previous okay. meetings. All right, we'll incorporate that going forward. All right, any other comments? All right, let's vote. Arenas. Yes. Davis? I'm voting no because I wanted to start at 11. <laughs> Camus? Yes. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Uh, reluctant aye. All right. <laughs> we have another chance to change this next week. We'll, we'll, we'll see how the lobbying works out between now and next week. All right. Um, so on to D1, setting a general plan hearing for December. Wait a minute, how can we do that? I guess we, we can do that. All right, for December 15th. That is D1. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Does that actually extend the um, the meeting even longer? Maybe maybe uh, maybe uh, Council Member Davis is correct. <laughs> I think our agenda already incorporates this general plan. Does it? Okay. All right. Yes. Yes. Okay, Lee's nodding his head. Okay, I don't see any hands from members of the public. So let's vote. Renus? Yes. Davis? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, item E is public record. Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. Uh, to summarize my public uh, record letters this week, since early October, I've been trying my darndest to create simple public service announcements at public comment to stay safe and be wary as COVID-19 cases were continually rising. I admit I use smaller statistical numbers to keep alarm down and to give a more dry positive measurement and outlook of the overall situation. However, the death statistic numbers that I've been using from page one of the Google search engine was much underreporting its daily cases and death count numbers. So my initial concerns of 70 deaths a week that could rise to 120 to 130 a week in, actual, in actuality are, are closer to per day numbers, not per week numbers. I'm sorry about this, but that's life with our society, media, and its human relationship. I thank you that in the least we now have a raise in human consciousness and more factual reporting from the Google search engine that is reporting more factually at this time. It seems the risk is being taken by a government that they feel with a vaccination process arriving, there can be a rise in cases without, with a minimum amount of new deaths. Uh, it is, so it is vitally important to continue to practice safety and, and physical distancing, to wear a mask and to wash your hands with COVID on the rise. I still worry that schools won't be able to open until the fall of 2021. 
Overall, I hope my words here over the past few months can be part of a process that can help make it safer and easier for both everyday community and local government to more openly talk and publicly talk about the overall plans to address COVID-19 and our societal future for the next few years until more regular patterns can return. Sorry where I may be wrong sometimes. Speak to myself in good terms what can be better ways to think and work. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Is there a motion? Motion to vote and file. Second. Let's vote. Arenas? Aye. Davis? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, we're on to item G. Uh, we have a consent item on dumpster day. Move approval. Second. No members of the public would like to speak on the dumpster day. Uh, let's vote. Arenas? Aye. Davis? Aye. Chemist? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Uh, item G2 is approval of the SAP grant for starting arts from Councilmember Foley. Move approval. Second. I see no members of the public like to speak on. Oh, Mr. Beekman. Hi, um, this is a bit a difficult thing to, to ask about uh, with art grant money. Um, I, I have a bit of a worry that some of your art grant money a few years ago was being used for uh, the Big Belly program in downtown San Jose. And I'm wondering how projects have, art projects have been, you even had an art proposition measure, I think, on your ballot recently, you wanted it, it anyway. So there's a, uh, there's a bit of concern. I th I'm worried that your, your art funding is somehow uh, dribbling into surveillance and tech things. I don't know if this is crazy talk on my part, and I'm sorry if it is. And uh, it's my ramblings here, but if it is, I, you know, it's an issue. I think we have to close that gap, that leak, that problem, and not be doing that. And so I thought I'd just mention it here, take it for what it is, and uh, uh, hopefully it can uh, be of be of purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's vote on the motion. Arenas. Aye. Davis. Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, item uh, three is update to Greater Downtown San Jose Economic Recovery Initiative. Councilor Pross, did you want to speak on this? Yeah, um, and I, I believe there were supposed to be some public speakers. I don't know if they're- Can we go there first? Yeah, thanks. Okay, the person with the phone number ending uh, 5140, welcome. Uh, sir, your device is muted. We're not able to hear you at this time. Yeah, you know, it's always funky how when you're in charge of the switchboard, Sam. Anyway, uh, the downtown, you know what You know what they need to do to redevelop the economics of the downtown? is a bulldozer. They need to bulldoze about half of it and start over again. Because the economic recovery, I mean, it's been under economic recovery for, I don't know, Four, three or four decades and look at it. I mean, I told you once, I'll tell you a thousand more times. It's looked like the COVID hit downtown last year, the year before and the year before that, et cetera. Okay. So what, what are you guys, what are your ideas about how you're going to make that downtown better? Because it looks like you've ran out of it. No one's living in those high rises either. You can't support a grocery store. You can't support a movie theater. You can't support the Hammer Theater. You can't support anything down, downtown. Those restaurants have been new restaurants every other year for the last how many years? I want to know what Pothead Paralysis uh, ideas are on this. You know, probably opening up a pot store. And maybe you know what we could be like Oregon. Open up an opium den next. And uh, make make all drugs legal down there. I don't know what else to do. You can't even keep a liquor store in business down there. How ghetto is that? I mean, look around your your city hall. It looks like crap. Thank you, uh, Wisa Murrow. Welcome, Wisa. 
Thank you, Mayor, Council Members, and City Staff of the Rules Committee. My name is Wisa Uemur, Executive Director of San Jose Tyco and a co-chair of the Greater Downtown San Jose Economic Recovery Task Force. In the second phase of the task force, we focus primarily on those sectors still severely restricted or unable to reopen and on improving timely communications between policymakers. The committee and task force members were able to dialogue respectfully across sectors, resulting in the list of recommendations that we submit to you for review. With our county's return to the purple tier and both cases and hospitalizations escalating in our area, we need to continue to work collectively across sectors to reopen safely and thoughtfully to protect our families, our customers, our audiences, our employees and our businesses and our communities. Many thanks to Council Member Perales and his D3 staff for their support in convening the second phase of the Greater Downtown Economic Recovery Task Force. It's my sincere hope that you approve his memo and agendize the task force recommendations for full city council discussion on December 8th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nate LeBlanc. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Thank you for um, considering this issue. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Council Member Perales and his staff, especially David Tran and the members of the task force for taking time out of their busy schedules, especially under pandemic conditions when so many of their businesses are in crisis for upping their level of civic engagement and focusing on these serious issues and bringing them forward for you all to discuss. And I hope to accept their recommendations and bring them forth to the full council. Um, as, as you're all seeing, we're still very much in a public health emergency and that these real life recommendations from people who are really out here trying to scrape by make their businesses work under these unprecedented conditions. It's just important that we listen to them and more importantly that we act upon um, the recommendations that we've made. Um, just wanna kind of say a little phrase I've been using throughout this pandemic that the city is going to continue to exist. The civic structure is going to continue to exist but there's no guarantee that these businesses, especially these linchpin businesses that we all think of when we think of our downtown and our business community um, just might go out of business if we don't take active steps to save them. And I think that you all have an active role you can play in that here and especially next week when this goes forward, if it goes forward. Um, grants and waived fees are the most important thing that we can do for them. Putting money in the pockets of these business owners is the single best way to help them. And I'd like to call a special attention to the proposed fee cap on delivery apps. Um, that's a way that we can help these businesses winterize, not just by buying tents and canopies and getting permits, but by helping them survive, especially if we go back into another full shutdown, lockdown situation like we were in in the spring of um, this year. So thank you for your time. Please move these recommendations forward and please do what you can to save small businesses at this time. Thank you. Claire Beekman. Hi, uh, thanks for the words of the previous speaker. I, uh, you know, I, it made me think of uh, people like Ash Kalra, who I, I try to mention often. I, he worked really hard the past summer to, uh, I, I think he was working on really interesting fair ideas of, of, of uh, forgiveness ideas for not only housing uh, tenants, but for uh, their apartment owners, for small businesses and for their landlords. I mean, he was working in ways that it could be worked all together, uh, you know, forgiveness ideas, you know, uh, you know, real community healing ideas, I felt, and to make sure we were all safe and, and felt protected. They're going to continue to be working on that into this next year. And uh, so I, I felt it's important to mention his name and his work, uh, how he can help local small businesses at this time. And... Um, I don't know uh, what other outlets to mention. Uh, contact people at the state level, contact your assembly persons. East Bay assembly persons have been working hard on these issues as well. Uh, they can be good resources to, to understand uh, your options. And uh, I guess that's about all I can offer at this time. Uh, I'm, I'm, oh, I guess to conclude, I'm still hoping, uh, obviously the vaccination process is starting and that I'm hopeful that in a few years time, we can be back to our more regular patterns and routines. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Jay Ross. Good afternoon, Mayor. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Great, thank you. And thank you to the committee member for considering Council Member Perales' recommendations and the recommendations of the task force. My name is Jay Ross. I'm a shareholder with Hopkins and Carly. Uh, our main office is located in the heart of downtown. I also was uh, uh, proud and happy to serve on the task force. Um, I know you all know that there's tremendous struggle uh, in, in all of our local businesses going on in the greater downtown area and elsewhere because of the pandemic and the struggles are growing. The task force recommendations uh, come from an inclusive process that encompassed voices from uh, frankly day-to-day -day experiences and uh, business owners and representatives from a variety of sectors. Uh, they're, they're well thought out. They're uh, a really great place for us uh, to get going and to keep going uh, as we start to try and help uh, businesses recover. The recommendations include policy and tactical ideas to provide short-term relief and long-term strategies for hopefully sustainable uh, economy and economic growth. Uh, please um, agendize these recommendations and pass them forward to the City Council for its full discussion on December 8th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 9706. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor, City Council. Uh, this is uh, Brendan Rossman, I'm Executive Director for San Jose Jazz, and wanted to speak on behalf of uh, the asking to move the recommendations from Council Member Perales forward uh, to the full City Council. Uh, I had the opportunity to chair one of the committees of the task force, the Arts and uh, Special Events Committee, and it was a, it was a great process, just to Jay's uh, uh, comments that he was just making, the breadth of engagement we had eight different committees that were participating, small and large employers, hospitality sector, arts and entertainment. Uh, the process has really reflected a, a great breadth of the downtown economy and was one of the few occasions when it felt that um, we've had an, an opportunity to work cross sector to come up with um, strategies that, that the whole downtown community uh, could get behind and advancing. So uh, greatly hope that uh, the rules committee will uh, move this forward. Thank you. Thank you. All right, back to the committee. Uh, Councilman Frost. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor, and, and to the committee um, and to the public speakers, uh, especially uh, the participants of the task force for making time to, to come out today. Um, and um, certainly uh, been a lot of work from the task force members and as uh, this committee may recall, uh, much like our first set of recommendations, uh, these are not my personal recommendations coming forward. This is the work of our task force members, uh, really, uh, as, as Brendan pointed out and some of the other speakers, a, a broad uh, representation of uh, businesses in our greater downtown area uh, that have certainly struggled through this pandemic uh, along with the rest of our community and um, and really put in a lot of time and effort to come up with these these recommendations. Uh, it's it's been a roller coaster ride, as we all know, um, and it continues to be certainly uh, as we've uh, been forced back into the, the purple tier. Um, and uh, it's it's certainly something that is still greatly affecting, and even more so, our business community in the greater downtown area. Our uh, local business communities uh, continue to look to have a place for, for their voices to be heard. That's one of the biggest things that uh, we have heard uh, consistently throughout this process. Uh, and so together, there were 55 different small businesses and local organizations that we convened through the Greater Downtown San Jose Economic Recovery Task Force. And during this second phase, uh, we expanded uh, from four to eight committees and we had stakeholders uh, of all sizes this time, uh, from small restaurants to the Billy DeFrank Center, up to the Hilton Hotel, and all the way uh, to Adobe. And so as you know, here in downtown, we face issues that are different uh, in nature compared to the rest of the city. Uh, and as the South Bay's urban core, where, where density um, was a driving economic force for the region, we are obviously now faced with a problem of where density is, is not our friend. And so we have worked to include businesses that uh, are not only in the core of the downtown, but also our surrounding neighborhood business districts, such as Japantown, East Santa Clara, Alam Rock, and the Alameda, uh, that really all feed into to making the heart of our city. And uh, after the last two and a half months, we had 40 meetings, both committees and the at-large task force, 
um, we've come up with now uh, these, these set of recommendations. Uh, they include things such as considerations for our next year's budget discussions, additional parking relief, coordinated marketing efforts, suggested programmatic uses for future relief funding, if that is to be made available, uh, and legislative advocacy uh, at the, the county and the state. This time around, we also set a separate set of recommendations to the county uh, through collaboration with Supervisor Allenberg's office and to the state governor's office uh, or the governor's office in collaboration with state assembly member Ash Kalra's office and our own intergovernmental affairs team. And so uh, from the last, just a, a, a bit of an update uh, from the last recommend, set of recommendations uh, and thanks to a budgeting effort uh, that was approved by, uh, by our council, there was, was $100,000 for downtown revitalization and our task force worked together to recommend how to best allocate those dollars. And uh, we are working diligently and, and Blogge from OED is working to, to get that money spent. Um, and we have micro grants that were approved for COVID-19 business related operations, uh, beautification and placemaking uh, that is happening now, destination marketing, and uh, a downtown economic stimulus and recovery study, uh, which also happened to leverage additional funding through uh, our Office of Cultural Affairs and uh, the private sector. And so uh, it's now um, my honor to present these recommendations to you. I ask that you approve that they be agendized uh, um, for the next council discussion. And again, I wanna thank everybody who participated in the task force and uh, for those of you that showed up today to speak up um, on behalf of, of all of our greater downtown and business communities needs. Uh, and thank you, and I'm here for questions. Thank you, council member. Uh, Lee, I, I didn't see a workload assessment uh, from the city manager's office on this. You guys have a view? Uh, no, we're in agreement um, to add it to December 8th, and it's part of an existing work program and work plan that's already been accepted. So this would funnel into that existing work plan. So we, we did no form, but essentially it is a green light. Okay, I recognize some of these recommendations obviously are uh, fairly straightforward and some are pushed off to the budget process. Uh, others look like they may take more work. And I just wanna be clear, everybody's being really explicit about this is getting on a work plan or it's not. Um, and, and as you look at all the recommendations here, is, is, is staff saying we got we're green light on all of them? No, I mean, I think the, the overall work program, I think is a green light. Uh, again, you're absolutely right. Some will be funneled into the budget process and, and obviously you guys will have a hand in that. Others, you know, there's, there's things referenced around like the state, uh, our state legislative guiding principles. Some of them may or may not be feasible given what the legislature choose to take this year. So um, I think there could be components of it as we get further on and understand some of this work that could come up in the roadmap exercise, um, let's say that we previewed with you, but as a whole right now, we're comfortable with them moving forward. Okay. All right, for the committee. Motion to approve. Second. Any comments? All right, let's vote. Arenas? Yes. Davis? Aye. Amos? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. I want to thank say you. thank you to, uh, to the many uh, strong advocates in downtown for small businesses and cultural community. Uh, thank you to Lisa and Brandon and uh, Jay and many others who, who all weighed in. Appreciate hearing from you. All right. Uh, on to item four, which is the JPA issued bonds for moderate income housing. Um, Councillor Camus, uh, I know this is your initiative. Did you want uh, you want to go to the public first, or yeah? Or? If, if there are people from the public that want to speak, let's go to them first, please. Okay. All right. We have looks like four hands up. Uh, Anil Babar. Thank you, Mayor and members of the Rules Committee. Uh, this is Anil Babar with the California Apartment Association, and we wanted to voice our support for the city joining uh, Cal CHA. We think that this program can help generate the affordable housing op, uh, units that the city needs quickly and definitely to the benefit of the city. This is a proven model that has created affordable units faster than ground up construction. It should be considered another tool in the housing department's toolbox to address the severe affordable housing shortage we are facing. By joining the JPA, it sounds like it can join the many other cities 
after careful vetting, agreed to benefit from this program. A part of my mind out is that it's found an innovative way to find affordable housing quickly and efficiently. So, in summary, we encourage the city to join the CK program immediately. And uh, I thank you for uh, taking this subject on. Thank you, Matt Reagan. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, City Council members. I'd like to echo the comments of the previous speaker. Uh, this is Matt Regan with the Bay Area Council. Um, also urging you to vote in favor of joining the, the JPA. Um, uh, I don't need to explain to any of you uh, the, the depth of the housing crisis that we're experiencing here in the Bay Area across California, which has now been compounded by a health crisis. Um, this particular program offers a very unique opportunity to build the types of housing units or rather create the types of housing units that uh, we've not been able to, to do uh, through traditional vehicles. Um, there are no financing mechanisms available through bonding and other tax credit programs to build this type of housing and the market can't build it at, at current construction costs and land costs. Um, so in order to fill this hole um, we need innovative ideas and what you have in front of you is an innovative idea. It's also an innovative idea that comes with very little risk. Um, there are 19 other jurisdictions across the state that have already successfully joined um, the uh, JPA and have projects uh, in the pipeline or open and operational. Um, I will conclude by saying we, we are seeing an, uh, a very troubling exodus of many companies from the Bay Area just yesterday. If you look announced they're moving their headquarters to, to Texas. And the, the unifying message we're hearing from those companies is the inability to attract and retain talent because of the cost of housing in our region. Um, we need to do something urgently about that to stem that flow. And this is a piece of that puzzle. So we would urge you, please do not look back a couple of years from now at, at a, an incredible missed opportunity. We would urge you to take this vote and, and join the JPA. Thanks so much. Thank you. Vince Rocha? Hey, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, I would agree with the previous speakers. You know, creating solutions that will give middle income renters relief now is just an important reason for San Jose to join California CHA. The first point on the city's 15 point housing plan is financing housing for the missing middle to craft a pub private public financing mechanism for rent restricted housing. This checks that box. AMI. Uh, housing missing middle is usually 60 to 120 percent AMI, really hard for the market to build to that. And often subsidies don't really exist um, for that and bonding or otherwise. So what this does is you have a model that is proven. Um, they will, Cal CHA will soon have acquired nearly 1500 units across the Bay Area. Um, these are units that went from being market rate to middle income. People's rents are being lowered all across the Bay Area. San Jose can have that too. They can join this program and renters will see immediate relief from any acquisition done by Cal CHA. This program exists without the need for city subsidy, freeing up valuable capital for targeting homelessness and lower income housing production. And I encourage the members of the Rules Committee to recommend that the city join California Community Housing Agency as another tool to address San Jose's affordable housing needs. Thank you. Tim, Tim Bovian. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of the Rules Committee. Tim Bovian representing the Santa Clara County Association of Realtors. Uh, SCORE supports the City of San Jose to join Cal CHA in its current proven form. Uh, this innovative new strategy is a perfect tool to continue to work to solve the region's housing crisis. Cal CHA have created an effective program to address an issue we've been struggling with for decades, um, creating ample supply of affordable housing. The current COVID-19 pandemic and a possible lasting economic recession is only going to worsen that current crisis. Becoming a member of Cal CHA will allow San Jose to quickly create much needed housing for a missing middle population, such as nurses, teachers, and other public servants without enduring any displacement. This also creates a pathway for the city of San Jose to take ownership at no cost to these affordable housing assets, providing an opportunity for the city to provide perpetually affordable housing across the income spectrum. 
This is something that the city of San Jose can and should be doing to provide much needed affordable housing to public servants and the rest of our missing middle population. Once joining the JPA, the city still maintains control as to where this form of housing can take place. And it has been effectively designed to ensure maximum flexibility, increasing success of the policy. It also creates immediate affordable housing, as I said, without displacement or adding any uh, workload to city staff, allowing additional resources and time to be diverted to other affordable housing efforts in the city. SCORE strongly urges the city of San Jose to join Cal CHA in its current form, adopting a program that has already been implemented across the state to great success. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Brian Wolf, welcome. Hi, Mayor and uh, members of the Rules Committee, uh, Brian Wolf at Bay West Development. We've been following uh, Cal CHA and Catalyst for a number of years now, and the work they're doing to produce affordable housing uh, in the Fit region is, is nothing short of incredible. Um, you know, we think some of the most important factors of this are uh, the ability to create this affordable housing quickly without having to be reliant on public funds. Um, not only through purchase and acquisition of existing buildings, but we think there could be an opportunity for them to do it uh, via new development as well. And then secondly, the kind of the long-term benefits to the city uh, once the bonds are paid off, it could be an economic stimulus uh, for the city, uh, albeit a, a ways out, but uh, a smart um, way for the city to uh, generate additional revenue in the future, uh, in addition to providing uh, more affordable housing. So we would support uh, the approval of Cal CHA um, it, via. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Mahmoud Khan. Right. Uh, 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 hello, everyone. Oh. <clears throat> and the mayor, uh, Licato, and the council. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, come up and sort of highlight uh, what uh, incredible opportunity we have with Cal CHA. Uh, I am a board member at San Jose Conservation Corps and Charter School. And uh, Sam, you probably know us very well. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been involved in it and helped us a lot. And, you know, we've been following this. Uh, homelessness and especially low income uh, housing issues for quite a, a number of years. And uh, I think this is a fantastic opportunity to get in uh, and support Cal CHA with the, no risk whatsoever that I can see. Uh, and, and in the end, uh, the economic jab that we're gonna get from this is exactly what we need uh, and, and key part uh, of, of this benefit, which is a side benefit, is, is really the retention of the workers. Uh, we want to retain our students around here, uh, also the teachers and uh, uh, the, the, the nurses and uh, lower income uh, folks. And I think this, this will be, it will go a long, long way to retaining that. And in the end, uh, you know, there may be some other opportunities to do something with these properties that the city will acquire, like perhaps uh, uh, rent to own type of situation and also uh, uh, selling it at a favorable uh, price for the people to own themselves. So that can be explored later, but I think we must not miss, miss this opportunity. And I appreciate uh, you letting me talk about that and uh, all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Reed, welcome, man. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council members. Um, first, we really appreciate staff work on this and the challenges with, you know, I know there's a lot on their plate um, and the importance of working through the details as this moves ahead. Um, we've had multiple opportunities to speak with the Catalyst staff about Cal CHA. This is really a new uh, emergent product. Um, and it's great to hear that there are multiple players that are exploring this. And we know that staff is invested and interested and that this is an opportunity that, that I, it looks like we're gonna embrace. Um, I, I won't repeat what others have said. We think this is an important uh, opportunity for the following reasons. Um, 
First, we don't believe that entering into this relationship with Cal CHA precludes entering into similar relationships with other authorities in the future. It isn't clear there has to be a choice or that the city's investments need to be overwhelmed given the potential benefits. In fact, it seems clear that the work that's been done already uh, has produced value in assessing other possibilities. We believe that the model responds to a pressing need for missing middle housing. Um, while we, we recognize that some portion of each project would clearly be roughly at existing market rates, the program design targets a third at below 80% AMI, and this has real value. This is an area where we have faced real challenges. Um, finally, it's been acknowledged by both staff and council that this next period of time in, in the city is going to be one of some instability in the multifamily market and is ripe for speculative investors. And there may be opportunities to step in, add stability, take advantage of value opportunities and create lasting resources. We don't currently have the capacity to take advantage of this moment uh, and we urge you to, to move this forward to council. Thanks. Thank you, Mandy. All right, let's come back now to the committee. Uh, Council Member Camus. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, like, I well, I appreciate uh, staff's work on on, um, on 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 what they presented in their memo. Uh, the city's housing element, an annual report from 2019, showed that there was zero units of deed restricted moderate income housing completed or in the pipeline from 2015 to 2023. And I know one of your goals, Mayor, was to provide low-income housing 20, up to 25,000 units in five years. If this doesn't even, you know, this goes out well over five years, and I don't think we're going to get any of the 80 to 120% AMI if we keep going down the same path. And to me, this provides a no-brainer. This is absolutely a no-brainer for our city to create housing uh, for our working you know, class folks, people who are our teachers, uh, the people who are working our, as nurses and, uh, and, and mechanics and, and the people who we want to keep in our community and not displace them to go over to you know, Texas or wherever else they're, they're flying to. It also keeps corporations um, here as well. Uh, it's a no brainer because it won't displace anybody um, for, for the, for the for the uh, units that they've already purchased, they're not displacing any immediate, relying on attrition and reevaluating rents at the units there or that they've uh, are handling. There's no financial risk whatsoever, um, and and the staff reports points that out. There's some, you know, headline risk as as staff uh, recommended, but we face headline risk with everything that we do, uh, even with school districts that they they. Um, that create headline risk, and we we actually help with their bonds. Um, there's no uh, there's no need for uh, ad staffing um, because they manage the properties themselves. And in the end, this is much faster than than building. And guess what? At the end of the bond payment period, the city gets assets for free. They, they don't they get. I mean, how often do we get free land? Uh, even, even if it's a dilapidated older building, it's something that we currently pay for. When we bought the Plaza Hotel, we spent millions of dollars uh, fixing it up. This will be land that the city can gain uh, at the end of the bond payment period. And guess what? My favorite is no new taxes. No new, no new taxes that are, are currently driving out our middle income earners out of the state, um, and 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 uh, and that's why I think that this is a good idea, and it belongs on the city council agenda. Uh, I'm hoping that we are, are um, uh, we can move it forward as early as uh, I don't care the eighth, the fifteenth. I'd love to to go forward on this. I think it's a, a um, it's a product that is time has come, and I'm I'm hoping to move this discussion forward, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, before we come back to other committee members, uh, Jackie, Jared, Lee, maybe you want to weigh in here, Julia? Yeah, Jackie, you'll start us off. Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, first of all, I just wanted to be clear that we absolutely see that this has some potential and merits for a modern income housing approach, and it definitely has potential opportunities. 
The administration agrees that the proposals offer us a new tool to serve moderate income households. And when you consider the rents that one would be able to achieve in this program, um, as high as $3,186 a month for a one bedroom at 120% of the AMI, uh, to a low of over $2,000, so $2,100 for an 80% unit. So I just wanted to make sure we were clear regarding this is not a low income housing program. It is absolutely a moderate income and clearly at the 120% level, you're at market rate rents. Um, we have found that since we actually published our memo that this approach is beginning to get some legs across the state of California. And since we, again, we submitted our memo, we've learned of two new JPAs that are operating in California. And so this idea is definitely expanding um, and there's lots of opportunity. Unfortunately, both housing and the finance department have been working nonstop since the pandemic. For 10 months straight, staff have been working long hours trying to meet the immediate needs of our residents while continuing to work on key projects. From my perspective, the housing department does not have the staff capacity to take on even one more work item with del without delaying other projects. Working on this now means we would have to put aside our work on displacement and it would impact our ability to work on tenant preferences. The finance department is about to take on the airport bonds and the financing of a new fire station. Julia can provide more detail on what work items could potentially be Im uh, impacted. The administration understands from the last rules meeting that it is your preference that we not get stuck or buried in analyzing each proposal. So instead of analyzing each individual JPA, because now there's not just two, but four, the administration is recommending that we issue an RFI. This would allow us to select a JPA or a program that best maximizes the available resources to meet San Jose priorities. And so again, it's not that we think this is an awful idea. We think it has a, you know, it's a, an idea worth exploring. The primary issue has been the staff capacity and our focus on um, COVID-19 and high priority projects. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, anybody else want, want to weigh in from administration before we come back to the committee? Okay. We're here for questions. All right, great, thanks. Uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you, Mayor. And actually, I was going to ask Jackie and Julia to reiterate their workload that they laid out to us the last time we had this conversation. So it was abundantly clear then, and it's abundantly clear now that they already have a full plate, they're overloaded, and there's not the capacity or bandwidth to work on this right away. The other um, uh, item or issue that you brought up, Jackie, which was I was going to ask is in terms of uh, an RFP. So you're, you already stated that uh, your desire would be to go out to a, for an RFI process, which makes a lot of sense to me. Um, even though Cal CSA was the first one to, to approach us on this, obviously we discovered there, there's multiple entities that can possibly provide the service and, and, and acquire those properties. And so it makes a lot of sense to, to go out to a public process and find the, the best entity that can service uh, or satisfy our, our goals and objectives. Um, I also wanna um, reiterate that we're all in favor of you know, building middle income housing or acquiring middle income housing. We all recognize the need and the, the demand for it but we have to prioritize. And I think staff has done a great job of laying out the priorities of what they're working on and what needs to be done first. My question to you though is, can we get a timeline on when we could possibly have the RFI issued and when you can start working on the, on the project or the process? And I'll direct that to, to Julia first and then Jackie. Well, I mean, I think Jackie and I had talked along with Jared about trying to put something out and be back to council in the springtime um, with the analysis, assuming that there aren't any other emergencies that drop in our lap. 
um, you know, with respect to trying to fit it into the workload. Um, Jackie, I, I think that's what we were, were talking about a couple of days ago. Yes, what we were thinking of is we could do a release of the, the RFI sometime in March and April. So as long as, you know, COVID continues to move forward and as Julia said, there's not some new crisis of, uh, then we would, we feel confident we could do that, uh, at least begin that process in March and April, and then however long it takes us to finish it. So that sounds very reasonable to me. Um, I would be supportive of moving forward with, with that timeline. Um, but I'm, I'm not supportive of, of rushing this. I want to give staff an opportunity to do their due diligence. Uh, even though some people might think of this as a no-brainer, uh, reading your memo and all the issues that you raised and all the concerns that you had, uh, it, it doesn't come across as a no-brainer to me. And that's that's my comments, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rennes. Thank you. I, I actually want to um, one commend um, my colleague, uh, Councilmember Camus and Councilmember Diep for their interest in in addressing middle class housing. It's something that I I know that I am very much in support of. I have a really large middle class community um, that's very strong, and and I'd like to see more of of of. Uh, of that community being supported. Now, with that being said, I, I also want to support our own departments with the priorities that we've already established. And I know that um, I have added to your workload, Jackie. Um, and we all have, right? Uh, and this pandemic has, has uh, required most um, of you and demanded a lot from you and from your, your housing um, uh, staff. Let me ask you a question. If if you were to do this now, if you were to take this on now, you said you would have to let go of something. Um, so either we let go of something or you can add additional um, uh, housing staff, which I think this is a really good time, Jackie, to advocate for additional housing staff, seeing that we're going to have a lot of these issues coming up. Um, uh, w w the other option would be that you have additional staff and it sounds like you don't. I mean, even getting additional staff is like a three month process. So it doesn't even speed up anything, right? Because you still have to have a job description. You got to post it. Like, unfortunately, it, nothing we do right now is very fast. And so um, even if you said, we'll give you staff to do that, it's not something that happens in a, in a any, won't, wouldn't happen any faster than the proposal we have come back with, which is the mm -hmm. March, April timeframe. Yeah, um, so, so I just wanna make it clear. I, I get that this is a really good option. Um, and I think Vice Mayor said it, you know, that this is a no brainer. Um, this is a, a clear option. I think it's it's about timing, um, and it's about um, you know we have a, a a a timeline that's coming to us. Twelve thirty one is spend a lot of our CRF money and um, and to manage those programs and uh, all of the uh, responsibilities that go with that. And so I'm I'm not inclined to push something else on uh, one month before the year. And, and before that, that looming timeline onto our housing staff. I've always and have been, will continue to be a supportive uh, advocate for housing of all different levels, low income, as well as uh, middle and, and, and market rate for crying out loud. Yes, we, we need everything. Um, I just don't think it's the right time. And, um, I think that, that Jackie, you've already said that you could take this on just given some, some leeway. And I think you said uh, springtime would be most appropriate. And so I hope that, that this is something that we can move towards. I don't know that Jackie, you're saying no, you're saying let, let, let us 
take a let's let us finish the work that we're doing now um and and uh, and you know and, and let me talk about that a little bit more because i think we have been, been very demanding of uh, all of our staff all of our senior staff and we also have to be careful not to lose the talent that we have right now we we're um uh, gifted with a lot of folks who have a lot of institutional knowledge and and I want to keep it that way and I think we this is part of managing and making sure that we're reasonable with with um, all of our departments so um, I hope uh, council member um, Camus I know there's not a motion on the floor but I'm hoping that that we can um, defer this item until and I'll make a motion to defer this item until Mar oops apologize about that to defer this item until uh what would you say Jackie after the RFI is released in March is, I think that's what you said well we would be happy to release an info memo in March or April letting you know we've released the RFI and to give you the time frame of when we would be coming back um when that process would be completed. Wonderful. So then I would um, make a motion to defer this item so that we can receive additional analysis or at least the informational memo that can uh, give us an update about what you've done so far um, towards an RFI. Second. Thank you. Um, I want to understand better, Jackie, what um, from page two of the memorandum, um, I understand, believe me, I get the fact that housing's had its hands full on all things COVID um, and your team's done a great job under the, under the pressure and the circumstances. The items that I saw that took priority of the anti-displacement strategy and the Deardon Affordable Housing Implementation Plan, that's what's mentioned on page two, is that right? And then I think there's also a strategy for moderate income housing that I'm told that you also want to prioritize a, ahead of this. Is that right? No, actually, that's not correct because okay. this is part of that's one of the reasons why we're agreeing we would take it back up because the item that we've we've put on the shelf, frankly, has been the moderate income housing strategy of which we were hoping to bring something like this forward and had been working towards that. It has been the project that has really suffered as a result of COVID-19, frankly, right. uh, because we just don't have capacity. So if the assumption is, and I understand Kristen is the person doing the heavy lifting on the policy work here, um, so is uh, I'm just trying to understand what uh, the implications are of your statement that the RFI would be something you start working on in, in would you say March or April, is that right? That's correct. Does that mean the middle income or the moderate income housing strategy would come after that? Is that, is that what the assumption? Correct. Okay. And by the way, I completely support that because look, I, I know strategizing is important, planning is important, but we have actual housing we could get built and that's that would seem to take priority and I, I wanna make sure we do that. Can someone explain to me why the RFI process, um, do we actually, obviously we can't shortcut basic legal requirements around transparency, making sure we're offering all the potential players. We know there are four now, there may be more soon. Uh, every, everyone gets a fair shake and equal shot at this. I'm assuming that ultimately, if we get to the finish line, as I hope we do, there's gonna be more than one, maybe two or three, who knows. Um, why RFI as opposed to going to council and having council say, okay, staff, here's our, and we, obviously staff would be working on this to, to get to council, but hey, here's our term sheet basically. These are the conditions in which we're gonna sign an agreement to join a JPA. It's gotta meet these minimum requirements and anybody wants to come under those conditions, we welcome you. Is that, does that help 
reduce or eliminate any steps here because I think we've all been through the pain of procurement and RFIs and RFPs. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out if there's a straighter line to the finish line. Um, I, I could take a stab at commenting on that, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the RFI could either be broad and just invite proposals or it could be specific. Um, I think with the timeline of trying to issue the RFI in March or April, um, we may be able to have some specificity, like we'd like to investigate things that ha include some lower targeted units, for instance, um, but not be so specific that we would get zero responses back because it wouldn't be mathematically possible, for instance. And so I, I think it's kind of a, a balance. Um, I do think that when we get proposals back, we'll have to evaluate them. And I do, I think that the way we evaluate them is, you know, assessing them in certain areas. And I think those policy priority areas are something that we would, you know, come up with um, probably guided by your all's, you know, policy preferences, frankly. So hopefully I'm not overstepping what our director thinks we can do, but um, I, you know, we would compare and contrast, but then we would also be giving back a recommendation when we are able to evaluate everything. And so how we evaluate would, I assume, be based on some desirable terms, at least broad brush. Let me probe a little further here because it just feels like this is gonna be a very long process, uh, particularly where there are gonna be a lot of um, there are, there are many variables, I'm sure, in, in these various JPAs, I'm guessing, um, and coming up with objective criteria and making sure that I, I could see how this could get us pretty deep in a, in a rabbit hole. And I, I guess I'm less concerned about us putting out a, a set of conditions and having nobody respond because that's information, right? That, that tells us, okay, uh, the won't market won't work at this level, so let's go back and adjust, right? Um, so if you know the council got together and we decided, I guess currently what I've heard from one of these, off, uh, one of these organizations is that, you know, one third of their housing would be rent restricted at eighty percent AMI. I think another third at was it another third at hundred? I think is what they said. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, so if we said as a council, okay, let's set the bar a little higher and say a third has to be at seventy five percent. Right, um, and we put that together with other conditions that say, you know, the it can't be any recourse to the general fund, and you know, no risk, blah blah blah. We put all that out there. Um, wouldn't it facilitate us getting to the finish line faster than going through an extensive RFI RFP process, and hopefully consume less staff time? I think that um, evaluating the proposals against each other won't be too much. I, I guess in my in my perspective, I think it would not be a good outcome to write an RFI and use that time and get zero responses back um, because we could have written something a little bit more broad, a little bit less directive, gotten responses back and then compared what's the best we're gonna get. Um, and again, the evaluation criteria, you know, I'm, it would be like the category of deeper targeting rather than, well, thou must get to a 70% AMI level. Yeah. Well, I can, you know, my concern. That, that was my thought. And that could, those buckets could be defined at the same time we are waiting for the RFIs to come back. Right. My, my, my concern, though, is that I think we're going into this with the assumption that there isn't necessarily going to be one winner. There could be, multiple entities mm -hmm. yeah. and does that to some extent undermine the likelihood that competition is going to get us our best result as opposed to us saying well, hey this is what we want you got to jump over this bar so mayor this um just to you to christian's point about an rfi an rfi is a request for information so uh, we could just put something out there that's very broad the city of san jose is looking at a moderate income housing program send us your pitch book 
that is that simple because mm -hmm. we know there are companies out there that are pitching this product, right? JPAs, individual investment banking firms, and they send us their pitch book. Then we theoretically have at least asked for the universe of people that may be interested in doing business with us and being able to sit down and say, okay, this looks like this looks just like this. And then be able then to define a scope of what our parameters would be in the solicitation of somebody that we could do business with. Maybe there's somebody out there that has a product that's really close to what we want. You know, we don't, we don't know that because they, they keep kind of popping up. So, so that would be the intent in my view of doing an RFI is just to make sure we have all the data points from firms and JPAs that may be providing this product across the country. Yeah, I guess my concern with that is that again, I think leads us down just into a lot of rabbit holes of trying to evaluate each and every program and compare their apples to their oranges and try to assess in some objective way what's better, what's not. And we all know there's lots of ways to hide things on term sheets um, that could be less than the competitive process I think we would all want if we knew there was just one variable involved here, right? And so that's why I had suggested just the opposite process, which is we define what we want first. And we say to the market, who wants to leap over this bar? And at least that way we're controlling the terms and we're very explicit and we're not wasting a lot of time getting down rabbit holes. So I would think that even if we did your approach, we still would want to be thoughtful regarding what that term sheet would look like and uh, what all what are the most important variables. And so from my perspective, we're still not picking up the project until March or April to April to do that thinking. Um, but then in, instead we would come back in either March or April with here's what our proposed term sheet looks like, do you agree? And then off we go. Yeah. It seems like you can spend more time up for, like later on looking at what you got with a quick RFI, or you could spend a little more time up front defining what is it we're trying to get and then either get fewer proposals or very on point proposals. Either way, we'll have to come back and say, they did well in this, they didn't do so well in this, and then you know, lay it out. I mean, there will be analysis in laying it out. I guess, let me just disclose my bias. I, I've read the memo and I know we've been through a couple of committee hearings on this. And my bias is, is that staff is asking an enormous number of questions about things as if we were investing our own money in this, these housing projects. And there are, for example, a question of, about tax exempt status. You know, if we've got an opinion from Oric Harrington <laughs> and they specialize in this stuff and they're putting their name on a letter and they're standing behind it and we're saying, well, we're gonna spend an enormous amount of time determining whether or not they're right and we're not the ones at risk it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that we are spinning our wheels on it it doesn't make a lot of sense for me for example for us to assess whether or not they're paying bond counsel or underwriting firms too much if we think their profits are too high let's demand more affordability and get the outcomes we want whether they make money or not shouldn't be our problem. The question is, are we getting what we want for the public? And similarly, you know, issues around, for example, the positions of other taxing entities in the state. Well, again, it's, it's not us that's at risk here. And I never heard concerns about other taxing entities when we ran a redevelopment agency for a quarter century. And, and we're absolutely wrapping ourselves around the axle on these issues. And it's making me 
believe that we just aren't that interested in leaning in on partnerships that involve entities outside of City Hall to solve problems that we clearly do not have the resources to solve. You know, we have produced none of these units in recent years. We don't have the resources to produce these units. And the nature of public-private partnerships requires that we be open to engaging with entities outside City Hall to get something done rather than insisting we always know how to do better. And my concern is that we seem to be taking an approach that would make it impossible for anyone meaningfully to engage in getting this done for us. And that is probably about the only path we've got in a world in which we don't have the resources. So I've just given a few examples of concerns I have based on the memo and what I've heard. I know that I'm not in the weeds. I don't have nearly the detailed information you do, but help me understand why I'm wrong. <laughs> I don't necessarily think we object to partnering with an outside entity for all the reasons that you stated. This is not an area in which we play in. Um, but we also know the challenges of working and joining a JPA and then not having um, the type of ongoing relationship that we would like to have in terms of uh, what one would expect because you're technically, you're a, part, you're a partner in it, but the reality is that they don't actually listen to you or respond to anything you have to say because they've uh, received what they've needed. And so I think we just as a staff believe that it's important for us to do our due, dil due diligence and review and just to lay out all the issues of which you then as the policymakers get to decide if it is important or not and it, if it, whether it is relevant or not. So again, from the housing department's perspective, we do see this as a potential new tool that can meet a, a need for a particular income group, a, a much higher income group than we would typically serve because our resources don't allow us to do that. And that there is a gap you know, in our market between what we can serve and what the market can serve. Uh, and clearly there's a portion of these units that will serve that gap. It's not gonna be the entire, but it's gonna be a portion of the units. Um, and I do think there, are, there could be ways that we could even creatively partner with a JPA if we wanted to even bring the AM, AMI levels down even further. So there's, there's definitely opportunity. And Jackie, I hear you. And I, you know, the word control comes to mind. That, that clearly, there's an issue about the lack of control that we would have. And I understand there's justifiable reasons for us to be concerned about lack of control. Uh, we know there's real impacts, particularly for the residents who are living there, surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, these can be well maintained, or they uh, in good condition. All those things. And so, I, I guess maybe the question is for Nora: with these, with JPA arrangements. Um, are we empowered still to be able to set our own terms if we decide there's some basic criteria that have to be met before we'll enter? In other words, hey, you gotta meet these terms in terms of property maintenance. It's just one example. All of that would depend on um, the uh, agreement itself for the development and what was built into it and then whether or not it was enforceable. So, um, it would it would really go back to a to a contract question, I think, Mayor. Right. So all this can be resolved through contractual negotiation. It, that's what it sounds like. Okay. Yeah. So by joining a JPA, we're not committed to accept boilerplate terms. Uh, we can say, hey, we'll join the JPA, but before you invest in San Jose, uh, you got to negotiate with us, and here's our terms. I mean, is that is that right? If, if the JP, if a particular JPA is willing to do that, we, right. you know, that that will depend on the underlying uh, foundation of that JPA. Right, and if they're not, then there's other customers. 
Okay. I, I, I appreciate staff's concern about control. I just think that there is a, a mechanism for us to deal with that. Right? Correct. And that mechanism requires us to think through all the issues and to lay them out so that we can have an appropriate agreement. And all of that takes brain power, not my brain power, thank God, but it will take some of my staff's brain power, of which she has very limited uh, brain power right now. I don't know if you can see how Actually, she's not yeah, I right know. now. Brain looks pretty good to me. I don't know. <laughs> but the, you know, again, a circle. <laughs> we, are, we did, I mean, originally we yellow lighted this, but we're coming back to you to say, okay, we're gonna, we had a moderate income plan, the housing department, we're gonna take it on. But what we're really asking for is some time to actually get through the work that we have now um, so that we can do this appropriately and actually get it done and not have someone who has to work 100 hours a week. So if I could just jump in really quickly, you know, Mayor, you, you raise really important policy questions and, and absolutely agree with you. You know, the, the problems that we face today, we're not going to be able to solve by ourselves, by, by any imagination. So, so how we partner is going to be really important. And, you know, I agree with Kristen. There's, there's two different paths here. The, the RFI is one that, you know, we had talked about because it gives us a lot of information um, than to go do the work. You know, it, they kind of have to show us their cards or we can go the route of the term sheet and do some of that work up front. I, you know, at the end of the day, we probably arrive um, at the same finish line, uh, no matter what method. I think to, you know, I would say from the city manager's office perspective to, to back up Jackie on this, I think timing is more of the issue versus the policy questions you have that I think are really fair that we would want to figure out. Um, I, I think this is going to require some time from housing and from finance. And so I, I would just say, I think we're open to the avenue and the method here. I, I would say that the, the timing is our issue on this um, as we close out the CRF and hopefully get new stimulus money. Um, and finance is really heavily uh, weighted on in the EOC. We do require an, an awful lot of their attention through the recovery process and with FEMA right now. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I guess where I'm going with all this is I can't help but think that we are inadvertently, unintentionally creating more work for ourselves when we need to. Um, and I look, for example, at the arena housing needs allocation. This is just another bullet point that shows up in the report. We're not clear if the units acquired and subsequently income restricted would count for the arena allocation. Well, let's face it, no, no city in the state, to my knowledge, has met the arena allocation. So whether they meet it or not, we just want more affordable housing. Right, I, that's an important thing for us to think about and maybe resolve in parallel somewhere down the road. But that shouldn't be a barrier or a, a, a critical path issue. And it just feels like there's a lot of these issues that are being thrown out as critical path issues that don't need to be. And I proposed a term sheet idea, and I'm open to any other idea to get past this notion that what we're going to do is have an RFI, have a whole bunch of proposals, and then burrow into all the details of all the proposers and try to answer every single one of these questions. Because I don't think we are. I think the better approach, frankly, is for us to decide clearly what we want and force people to go where we want to go. Uh, Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and uh, appreciate all your, all your comments. I, I guess I keep coming back to, you know, Cal CHA came to us. That's the same thing as putting out an RFI. And they came to us and said, we, hey, we'll do it. And, and nobody else really has. My understanding is uh, CSCDA is creating a new JPA and they don't have anything yet. I don't know about these other two. In, in reality, about the four that we're talking about, how many of them actually have projects? We know Cal CHA has projects. If we're gonna be evaluating each of them and have to go with, go with all four of them or none of them, then why not just evaluate this bird in the hand? and go forward. I, I, I guess I just keep thinking, and you kind of alluded to this, Mayor, we're letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, as opposed to, hey, they're, they've proposed to do this thing. I assume that they've proposed to do this thing because they've got 
some property or properties that they're looking at in the city of San Jose and Jordan Moss is here in the attendee list, or at least he was, um, if we could ask him, I mean, if he's got something going on, then why not just say, yeah, let's evaluate this as a council and go forward with this one. And we can go forward with the other three if they come to us or if we put out an RFI and they respond, but we've already got a response. We don't have to wait till March to know if we're gonna get a response, we already got one. So I'd like to have Jordan, I have some questions for Jordan. Um, it looks like he's still there, if he can be brought over. Um, I think the person who would bring him over actually just stepped out of the room. Uh, Tony, are you able to pull him in? Well, you're figuring that out. I, I'll just clarify that our understanding is that both Cal CHA and CSCDA have focuses on certain sites and projects in San Jose, and that that's been true, and that that will be true no matter who you give a green light to or a yellow light to. But if they've uh, got folks are, something, folks are shopping. Great. If they've got something in the works, then then let's go forward. And and I would say instead of I don't know. I guess I think term sheet, I think, you know, what I saw in the memo, it looks to me like that's a big long list. What's the bare minimum? We're not doing this work. What's our bare minimum requirement? And let's go forward. Jordan, I, the questions I have for you, if, if, we, if we move forward with this, how soon would you be able to have a project that would help our moderate income people in San Jose? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, we actually, we've already come to agreement on uh, some fairly substantial opportunities within the city, specifically in North San Jose. Uh, we've got something under agreement that is, you know, north of 500 units. Um, and if I have the opportunity, you know, just to correct some of the things that have been said, we have tried to do that within the memo, you know, that our responses to the memo that was released, um, there's been sort of continual comments made around the lack of uh, uh, low income housing that's being created or the lack of below market rents that are being created. There are regulatory agreements recorded against every Cal CHA asset that specifically set aside at least one third of the units for low income households below 80% of median income. And while Jackie referenced some calculations based on Santa Clara County AMIs, which are some of the highest AMIs in the country. So if you just, you know, it's just math. If you just calculate what the maximum hypothetical rent could be, it's irrelevant, you know, given that at least two thirds of the units within the projects that we have been acquiring and converting are significantly below market from day one. Um, in most cases, even at the 120% level, even if those rents are capped by market forces, we additionally reduce those rents, just given that there's some you know, extra burden at the asset level around qualifying households, which don't exist at market rate properties. And so the give and take there is that we try to reduce those rents as well. Um, so sorry for the more long-winded response, but we absolutely have not only existing assets that we could close in the first quarter here, but there's also development opportunities that we're looking at that you know, to the extent that RENA is a primary concern, um, you know, those units would absolutely count towards the arena uh, goals of the city. Are you, are you talking about potentially doing new construction? We are, yes. I mean, that was another thing that was mentioned in the memo that um, there was a view that new construction or, you know, heavy uh, redevelopment doesn't work. And that's absolutely not the case. We're under agreement in in Southern California on a large project that is gonna be more than $100,000 per unit redevelopment. And we are just about to sign up our first new construction opportunities as well. Um, there's no subsidy in these transactions that was sort of referenced in the mem memo that subsidy would be required for new construction. Absolutely not the case. And what levels of AMI do your projects have? Can you, can you be um, specific about the, the AMIs? Sure, yeah, we have flexibility. Uh, but the regulatory agreement that has been utilized for every single Cal CHA acquisition to date, there have been four uh, closed, there will be one more closed um, in the first quarter, and every one of them is the same thus far. At least one third of the units are set aside for low-income households, 
you know, who earn below 80% of median income, at least one third for median income households who earn below 100% of AMI, and the final third uh, for moderate income households who earn up to, but not in excess of 120% AMI. So if we hit the third, a third, a third, you know, the average would be 100, obviously. But even at that 100% level, to be clear and to reiterate, um, we are, you know, regardless of the mathematical output of an equation that's based on county level AMIs, we are hard coding rents at the asset level that are substantially below market, such that at least two thirds of the units from day one are substantially below market rents. Thank you. And you said you had four, you have four properties. Do you have four properties total? Cal CHA to date uh, has closed on four properties. Uh, they will close on a fifth in the first quarter. It should have already closed this year, but there was an unforeseen <laughs> incident at the asset that had nothing to do with us. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you know, we have an agreement on something in San Jose. Should we be able to receive approvals that we could close in the first quarter? Uh, we have, uh, we're under um, agreement on a large transaction in Southern California. And there's a host of other uh, opportunities for us in the first and second quarter, based on the fact that we now have 19 members of Cal CHA. Uh, we've been unanimously approved in every one of those jurisdictions. We've been welcomed with open arms. Uh, people are excited that we have a solution to the middle income housing crisis. There's a reason why it's called the missing middle. There are no subsidies or motivations to create that form of housing in every one of these cities uh, where we've been unanimously approved, not one dissenting vote um, has realized that there is no risk to the city. There is an immediate production of drastically needed low market rate housing, and there is long-term financial upside to the city through the granting of all of the embedded economics to the city. Thank you. Um, those are all my questions for now. I just, I would, I would support if council member Camus wanted to put a motion forward, I, I would support this going at, at, on December 15th to the, to the council, because I think, look, Jordan's telling us he's already got a project um, or a property to be able to acquire. We've talked about the fact that we have uh, an upcoming eviction, possible eviction crisis. That's not only going to impact our lowest of the low income, it is also going to impact our moderate income. I've spoken about that at previous council meetings, I'm very concerned about it. And I, and I gotta say, you know, the, the middle income people are the people who suffer greatest because there are no subsidies. It's, as Jordan said, it's called the missing middle for a reason. When their kids go to college, they don't necessarily, they don't, you know, they can apply for the Pell Grant, but they don't qualify. So they're taking out big loans there <laughs> to get their kids to go to college. They, you know, have a hard time buying a house in, especially here in this, in this valley, because it is so expensive. They're not necessarily going to qualify because they can't get to a six figure down payment. This is, these are the people we're talking about. And I know, you know, people talk about nurses and teachers and firefighters. It's nurses and teachers and firefighters. It's, it's administrative assistants. These are people we need in our valley to keep us going. And we haven't done anything. We just very simply, we have not done anything. And we've got someone here saying we can do it. And we're, we've already done it four times and, and they, it's passed unanimously. And I think you said 17, uh, 17 other jurisdictions. I understand that we would be the, the largest, but I just think bird in the hand, let's do it. So I'm on board. So mayor, can, can I just say something, Please. you know, yeah. Uh, to reiterate on what Jackie was saying, we're not we're not opposed to the product at all. It's just a question of absolute capacity. The 15th of December is 13 days from now. If you want us to take action, you expect to see a staff report. Somebody has to write that staff report. Somebody has to review the legal documents. If you're coming forward with the JPA, we literally have no bandwidth. Our staff are working 12, 13, 14. I was still here sitting in council, sitting in the office last night when you were meeting in your council meeting. I mean, Julia, can I clarify? You've already written it. It's here. The entire council hasn't had a chance to weigh in on this. And I, we could weigh in on it 
and ask you to go forward and to do that work. I, we can't direct you at council. We can't direct you at rules to do all that work. I'm not asking for that. I'm asking for the full council to evaluate what we have. I, I just, it, the workload's becoming unbearable. I just need to tell you that. And we're starting to have staff that are just saying they're done. So um, I, I just, you need to be honest about the ability for us to get work done in a reasonable amount of time. And, you know, part of our product is we're trying to bring back to you a half billion dollar airport refunding. You got zero people moving through the airport right now. That's a pretty high priority project to create some savings for the airport, real meaningful savings so that we don't have an issue with their $1.2 billion in debt outstanding. So those are the kinds of things that we're trying to weigh in order for the risk to the organization and putting resources in place. And as Lee mentioned, I have a whole host of team members working on all the CARES Act stuff, making sure we're in compliance and keeping everything in, in check, you know, that have been diverted from other resources and other work efforts. So. Julie, can I just probe a little bit on that? I'm sorry, Councilman Davis, I, I don't want to cut you off. You, I'm done. Yeah, can I just probe a little bit on that? I understand we could spend hours and hours trying to assess the potential risks financially of, of any of these arrangements, but why couldn't this simply be solved with a condition that we put into any term sheet or any agreement as a condition to join any JPA? There's no recourse to the city um, and put in all the boilerplate language that we would put in that when we do all these tougher hearings, for example, right? Whatever it might be that constrains or eliminates risk and liability for the city. Why is it that we feel it's important to have to do what sounds like you're saying is that there's an enormous amount of work to be done. And I'm trying to figure out how we can get there without doing all the work by simply saying up front what we're willing to sign on to. And back to Jackie's point, it's just trying to make sure that we have the right people in the room so we make that list and bring it forward. And you know everybody keeps talking about that there's no subsidy. Don't forget the fact that this, these projects no longer pay property taxes. Right. So that is an indirect subsidy that the city and the other entities in the county won't be receiving property tax. So there is to some level a subsidy of the projects which helps make these projects pencil because they're sure. not paying property I, tax. As I said in my last meeting, I think look, this is a publicly subsidized program. I'd be the first to admit it. And ultimately, we're still going to have to review the documents in order for us to join the JPA. Right. It's still going to require staff effort and work. And the other 10 cities who joined, I'm sure, had more than 10 days in order to review the work. Nobody's asking us to join by December 15th. The question is whether we have to go to it's council and be able to get staff direction. I think that's the question, right? So just to clarify, and I just... I think if it is simply the memo in front of you now, bringing that forward for direction to continue to explore this, whether it's the 8th or the 15th, and if it's the memo that's already been done, I think that's possible. That's totally fine. I think, as, as Jackie had said, whether it's an RFI, workload analysis, or actually joining what's out there, that's going to take us some time. That probably isn't going to happen. And if, if council were to approve such direction on the, on the 15th or the 8th, you know, wouldn't happen until early spring. So I think that that's the part of the workload that we're we're worried about, not necessarily moving forward. Just to clarify that. Okay. All right, uh, Councilor Kemps. Yeah. Well, I'm 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 about to make a substitute motion, but I I also understand that this this um, you know this idea has been in front of housing for three years and I've, I am understanding that the, the legal department already weighed in on this and, and maybe uh, Nora could, could let me know. Um, uh, you know, Jordan, Jordan basically told me that the legal department weighed in on this two years ago. That I have not heard. Um, that's possible, but I have not heard that. Um, we, we would, whatever documents were coming in, the, the, 
the JPA documents, the resolution, all of that, we would have to look at that um, currently. I don't know if, if there was a review of any documents a couple of years ago. I don't know that. If, if you can, I'd, I'd really like to at least- I'll try to find out. I'd, I'd really like that because, because I know for a fact that this is not a, a brand new idea. It's a brand new idea for me, quite frankly, but not for mm -hmm. Jackie. Um, mm -hmm. certainly, and, and not for our staff. Um, it's an idea that's come to uh, fruition and has been tried in other cities. And I, and I, and I think it's 19, not, not 17 cities. Um, they have active proposals. And I think we need to do, we need to treat this like we did for the PACE program. How much RFPs and how much time did we spend for the PACE program? And that's the the one that we allowed to exist in the city of San Jose, um, uh, you know, to, to actually uh, do, uh, to, to go on people's tax rolls. And we, we allow those to, to happen. We allowed, uh, for example, we allow all these school districts, um, the, the TEFRA hearings, all, all of these um, um, schools that, that uh, depend on us uh, as a pass-through basically, a ministerial role. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm I'm in I'm in the the mayor's um, uh, idea here is that we're trying to overly complicate this. We actually have a program in front of us, and I'd like to evaluate it. I'd like to evaluate that program. Um, those other companies that want to do business in San Jose could submit their own programs, and I'm I, and, and I'm agnostic as to their to, to whether they end up doing business here or not, but. Um, but to me, this is a, it's not a good opportunity. It's a fantastic opportunity. And I think would be, uh, we would be uh, kind well, of. Uh, thank you for choosing freeconferencecall.com. You're helping people around the world communicate. Pardon me, I'll kick. <laughs> Somebody else is so bored on a different conference call. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what, I'll make a motion uh, to move this, uh, this memo to, uh, to be debated uh, City Council on December 15th, because I think it's worth the time. Second. All right, uh, Council Member Ennis. Uh, thank you. I, I know how to count to three, so I'm not going to put too much uh, into this argument. Um, um, but I did want to clarify that the people who are suffering the most are the people who are out there keeping you safe in your own home, the people who are out there serving you food, delivering your food, uh, transporting people. And so I don't want this to be a conversation that middle-class um, uh, community absolutely has some consequences, of course. I'm in, a, I'm a middle-class family. I have consequences uh, because of this pandemic, but I don't pretend to be the, the one that suffers the most. I know who's suffering the most, and that's the poorest of our community. And I haven't seen, such capriciousness in, in putting something forward when when staff and I have never heard from staff tell you that there's the 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 level of work is so unbearable and that you still want to strong arm our staff in a matter of 15 days because you can't wait 15 days for this matter to be in front of you. And so that is that is not the way to treat our department. It is absolutely not the way to uh, treat our department. And I'm really just really disappointed that you're uh, you're going to take the first taker, have uh, have some analysis go with that. I didn't know that the first taker to any of our proposals are the first ones that we go with. Um, I don't know why I, I can understand and I agree with you, uh, Mayor, that we should have a straighter line to this. Um, and I and I think our staff is saying they want to do the work on this as well. I don't think they disagree. Um, but this strong arming and this oversight um, of of the workload that's in front of our senior staff is is offensive um, and is disrespectful. Now I won't be supporting the motion, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I just clarify. I my own position, which is I, I don't think we should just take the first uh, applicant here uh, who's in front of us. Uh, what I've been arguing for for some time is for us to set a very clear threshold. There are a lot of questions that are raised in this memorandum and they're all reasonable questions. 
one way we can answer them is by saying what exactly we're willing to accept in those areas. For example, on maintenance standards or on affordability restrictions and say, these are the minimum thresholds. Um, and this conversation can go a whole lot faster, I believe, than having staff spin their wheels, spending hours and hours of time answering questions as I've pointed to before that we may not even need to answer <laughs> when instead we can actually set conditions up front that will ensure we only get partners that are willing to sign on the dotted line to our conditions, not theirs. Can I, can I ask you as a follow-up, um, would you, and I agree uh, in, in some ways with that, why not wait until um, after the CRF deadline that we have um, upcoming on December 31st and give them at the very least until January to complete the work, to, to, do, to, to do what you just finished um, uh, laying out? Because I think the current plan of staff is that we would be off in RFI land. <laughs> and I describe that not to be disparaging the staff in any way, but because as a city, we've had a lot of challenges through procurement processes um, and they take a lot of time of staff and they take a lot of time for us to get through them. And I know staff is absolutely being sincere and saying, we'll get to it in March or April. We all know there's a lot of challenges right now we're all facing and it may be a whole lot longer after that. And I can't help but think that we could save hundreds of hours of time if we were to simply define clearly. And I think honestly, council could take a whack at this in a couple of weeks and set some very basic parameters, not a lot of specificity, some basic parameters that would help really steer the conversation. And you know, maybe four suitors would suddenly become one or, or, or two because uh, folks would say, oh, we're not gonna sign up for that. Well, that makes our work a lot easier. And why couldn't we have that discussion in January? We certainly could, but honestly, there are two issues here. One is, I think Councilman Camus makes a good point that this has been before us a few times. We've been, we've been batting this volleyball around for a while. Um, and, you know, I am being deferential to the fact Councilman Camus has been trying to make this happen for some period of time. It's his last meeting. He'd like to actually see some forward progress. And nobody's asking that we sign on the dotted line in two weeks uh, or they have it all figured out. I think it's obvious that, you know, council hasn't been heard on this. It's reasonable to have some basic council direction. I'm not looking to subvert uh, uh, the workload of staff. I understand there are very high priority items that they're uh, on now and they'll continue to be on that are critical and they're spending a lot of, of, of hours on really important things. I'm just concerned after the dialogue that I've heard on this issue and what I've seen in the memo is we're spending a lot of, we are potentially spending a lot of time on things that we don't need to be spending time on. Uh, we don't need to be second guessing uh, the opinion of Orr Carrington staff, a, a, a law, a, a law office that's widely regarded as being the best tax experts in the entire state. Like, it's just not something we should be spending an enormous amount of time on. We can be focusing our energy on other things. Uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, I want to um, let Julia and Jackie and Lee and all the staff know that uh, I definitely hear you loud and clear. And also, you know, Councilmember Camus Davis and Mayor, I, I hear what you're saying as well. Uh, there still appears to be some disconnect in terms of your expressed desire and what staff is hearing. And I, I want to get a better idea, uh, Jackie or Julia, you know, when, when the mayor is talking about uh, putting, you know, putting together a term sheet, are, are we talking about you or Jackie going down to Staples and getting a, a form and put in a few, uh, you know, terms and conditions and have, you know, someone sign it and call it a day or what are we, even in the mayor's version, what are we talking about in terms of a, a workload or, or um, effort? Well, I Jackie, mean, you're on mute. Go ahead, Julia. You can start. Well, I mean, I mean, I think it's issues like Jackie was talking about. I mean, what are what are the affordability levels that we want? Do we want it just at 120 percent? Do we want some hundred? Do we want some 80? Do we want a mix of it? You know, what about the you know what what about how the developers are compensated bringing the project together in terms of you know um, you know philosophically. 
you know, people making a lot of money off of doing, you know, these types of projects and affordable housing projects just seems a little odd. Um, how do we make sure that the project managers are in place? Because they're looking at doing, coming in and purchasing class A properties. We know that class A properties have more amenities than low income properties. So that means they have a higher maintenance component. So how do we ensure that those rooftop terraces and the swimming pools and the spas and all those things that you see in a class A apartment project are maintained at a level so that at the 15 year mark, there's not a need to in put sufficient cash into it in order to maintain the facility. So making sure that there's a certain level of R&R &R replacement that goes into the project. I mean, that project in Santa Rosa was having some difficulty and has already had to have some infusion of cash into it in order to uh, make sure that it didn't default on some of their payments. So it's looking at those kinds of things. I mean, this first project that was issued, the Santa Rosa project was just issued in 2019. So it's not like there's a whole history of a bunch of projects out there that we can look at and see how have they performed, how have they maintained their, you know, their maintenance levels of those projects over time. So we would wanna make sure that there's triggers so that you don't end up with a project that now is no longer attractive to market rate people, right? Because it doesn't have the amenities it had when they moved in because they weren't maintained. So it's those kinds of things that we would wanna make sure that it's maintaining the product standard in which it was acquired. So, I mean, and how, how do you put all those into words, right? Um, that can be a term sheet that people can understand. So what you're saying is there, there needs to be um, a lot of time and thought put into even having a term sheet that incorporates uh, our, our um, objectives and goals and creates protections in terms of uh, having projects that don't meet our standards or our objectives. Yeah, I mean, I mean, 10 years from now, the council member who's a pro this project's districted in isn't going to be happy if it's been a rundown condition, right? So, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, because we lended our, our public benefit to the, this project in order for it to move forward. I mean, we had to be a member of the JPA in order for this project to move forward. And it basically, it's, that's what creates the tax exemption. And that's what recreates the property tax exemption. So we have some skin in the game and we wanna make sure those projects are maintained over time. Ideally, what we would wanna do is articulate what are the deal points that you all, you know, we would recommend that you would consider in a term sheet um, and just, you know, put on the very basic level, the high level, as Julia said, AMI, AMI targets um, and, and then, so, you know, the other partner who we haven't talked a lot with is obviously the legal team because this, the policy people will throw together <laughs> the term sheets of which the legal team then <laughs> has to ensure and review um, and make sure that it's written appropriately. Um, and of course, there are all the documents that have to be reviewed once somebody is selected. So um, I think, you know, again, it just is thinking through because the mayor would be correct. We would not include all of these things. Like, are you going to give us Rena credit? No, they're not. So, I mean, they're going to be items that don't make sense. Um, if we go the term sheet approach, which again is fine. We don't have objections to doing that, but even thinking through what would be in a term sheet and is still going to require some work between finance and housing and the city attorney's office uh, just to be really clear of what what we should even be asking for. Right. So um, what I'm hearing is not a desire to delay or stall. What I'm hearing is a desire to have a thoughtful process to create a, a a solid product so that we don't have a situation which I've seen happen <laughs> on many occasions where we're crafting and designing this on the dais, which is not the, the way we want to do this. <laughs> that's not the best way to do it. And that's 
something that I, I definitely would want to avoid. So I, I hear what you're saying. I, I um, Nora, I have a question for you. Um, as far as the process is concerned, if we create a term sheet, we would just send that term sheet out to to the world and see who responds and whoever agrees to that term sheet, we would have to have signed them up in a, in a JPA. So we had 10, 10 entities or five or 100, however many we would have to sign them up if they agree to the term sheet. I don't, uh, thank you for that question. I don't think that's the intent. And I think there's a little bit of shorthand with uh, with the term sheet, for example, because I don't think it would, I don't think the idea behind that is if you accept these terms, we're in a contract. Um, well, that's, I, what I, that's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand, but I, but I understood the concept of term sheet to be, these are the things that we want to see. And um, do you, are you interested in that? And what would your program look like? And then we'd have the, the, an opportunity to evaluate that. that. That's my understanding that we wouldn't necessarily, otherwise it would have to be an extremely comprehensive term sheet um, if it was just going, if it was actually going to be an agreement. Um, so I, my understanding is that there would be, these are the things we're looking for. These are the things we want. Um, uh, and and uh, we would get those out to um, people who are in this business and and see what kind of a who, see who is interested. Um, for example, some of the things that we would want, um, particular to San Jose, that have been discussed under a particular JPA um, arrangement, they may not be able to do something special or different for San Jose, and so that. That would be good to know. That I, that that's my understanding of this discussion. Okay, so what what you're describing is more a more comprehensive process of developing the term sheet as opposed to just putting some generic or general requirements and to see who bites. Is that? Well, I think if if it was to just have a um, if it was to have an agreement based on a term sheet, we would still need all the agreement documents. I, right. We could never go forward with a with a um, housing project um, just, you know, with a with a what's commonly thought of as a term sheet. But I think the idea is um, on the front end, can we say the things that we're interested in and see if there if there's a partner out there that's interested in what we're interested in, or do we solicit all sorts of ideas and information from people and then call our way through that? That that's how I understood this. I may be completely off base, but that's my understanding of the discussion. Great, um, thank you, Nora. Uh, again, um, based on everything I've heard and uh, especially Nora, based on your clarification of what I'm hearing, uh, I have to um, agree with uh, Councilman Burroughanus that um, we all are um, committed to seeing uh, middle income housing and uh, being built or, or purchased and available to that missing middle. But we're, we've heard from staff there's no way to get, to get around the work requirement that they do not have the bandwidth to do at this very moment. And I do not feel comfortable um, putting that burden on them. Uh, I don't see why we can't delay it past January. Uh, so I, I can't support the, uh, the motion on the floor, but uh, I just want, want you to know that um, if it does pass that uh, we're, we're definitely going to have to have this conversation again at council because um, we just can't keep putting additional burden on staff where they don't have the capacity, the bandwidth uh, to, to support it because we are going to burn people out. We're going to lose people. We're going to, uh, it's going to affect morale and we just can't continue to do that. So 
I can't uh, support the motion on the floor. So that's it, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Nora, could, if by the 15th, is it possible for the city attorney's office to offer just a basic opinion about whether or not, if there are conditions that are bleached, uh, let's say we have an agreement, obviously, with whatever party it is to join a JPA, we put a bunch of conditions in there around maintenance, around portability, et cetera, and they breach one of those conditions. Can we just understand if there's any recourse or what recourse there is for the city, what remedy there is with a breach? That, that would just be very helpful for us to know whether we can simply resolve all this through an agreement or whether we're really stuck with something we can't control. Sure, we can um, We can prepare a memo that would um, provide uh, all, what we can um, include in agreements that, that we could enforce um, and also consider um, a JPA platform and uh, what types of things we might um, have to agree to that are in the JPA. Um, we can we can uh, put together something that would outline those um, alternatives. Great. Would that be would that be helpful? Yeah, that would be great, even if it's verbal, just so we understand. Yeah. You know, really, what are the city's options? Because I think that will dictate how much work we really have to do. Uh, mm -hmm. I agree. If there's absolutely no recourse, then yeah, there's a lot of work for staff to go do. And let's all stop and take a breath. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, we can enforce this easily through a, through a contract, through an agreement. I think that means there's a lot less work for us to do. And we simply mandate what we demand. And if they don't satisfy it, then obviously there's a consequence that will ensure that we're made whole or whatever, whatever it is we're trying to achieve. Right. And the, and the only answer we may not be able to provide is whether or not um, there's a taker out there for um, the uh, some of the things that the city might want. We may not oh, of course. be able to say that. Yeah, of course. I'm not. Yeah, I, I know that's all speculative at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I just like to understand really if there is really a, a straight line here <laughs> uh, or the straight line looks more like a shortcut. And yeah. I know we're not going to take shortcuts, but we do want to take straight lines. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, sure. Councilman Cummings? Yeah, Mayor, I, I want to be clear. I, I, I think that this is a fantastic idea, and I didn't think that there's that much work to be done. This is why I thought, you know, there's boilerplate, you know, things already in place. Uh, the program's already been accepted by 19 other cities. The, the legal staff, from what I understand, had evaluated it two years ago, and I realized Nora wasn't aware of that, and, and I, my, my bad. I think we should have investigated that before, uh, before we brought this up, and hopefully she'll look for that. Um, I do want to discuss the criteria, as you discussed, Mayor, at, at, you know, before I leave office, and I, if, if it has to pass after I leave office is fine, but I, I do want to set the ball in motion because if we don't act on this, then we are ignoring yet again. I mean, um, I, I, I Council Vice Mayor, um, we've had we've had uh, this missing middle housing as a priority since 2015, okay, and we haven't gotten any. Uh, this will this will actually move the ball a little, and um, and we won't have to be responsible for maintaining and uh, I and and quite frankly, I don't believe that. Um, I don't think that somebody buying a property and is going to be maintaining it for 30 years is going to, you know, take away amenities necessarily. Um, I could tell you that I live in a, I have a homeowners association that uh, I live in, I have a, that, that won't allow us to use the swimming pool only because of COVID. But, you know, that, that you know, anyway, I just don't see that um, you buy this class A unit, put in, you know, people who, uh, who, who can you know? Who are having trouble make making ends meet here in the city, um, and then taking away all their amenities? I don't think that 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 um, you know. I don't think that's the, the the goal. But I think that's the criteria that could be discussed in in the, this uh, the fifteenth. So uh, you know, I'm willing to uh, modify my motion to say let's discuss the criteria. Um, if clearly here it doesn't look like you know. Uh, 
uh, we're going to pass this thing on on the 15th, but I would at a minimum love to discuss the criteria for moving forward, because if we don't move, if we don't move, then then we could just ignore it and just just take it <laughs> off of the, the goals and, and just forget about it. I mean, why have it as a goal to create low income housing at all? Um, and, and I, you know, I get it that enforcement might be um, might be an issue, too, but, you know, Donald Lofts which we actually helped finance, received 500 uh, phone calls for service from the police department. Uh, the Second Street Studios is having trouble and we manage those properties. Um, I, I, would, I would think that a lot of these privately owned units probably be better managed than the ones that we have actual control of. Um, and so I'd love to hear this discussion and, you know, and what this group or any other group is planning to do now, on management, so, so if we don't so, have that discussion. Then, then, then you could just put it on the back burner forever. So, did you? Are you modifying your motion? Yeah, I wanted. Uh, you know, I wanted. I want to. If it's okay with the, uh, from uh, from what I understood from the mayor, he wants to set forth criteria, and I think that, I think that the, the city council should set forth a criteria, and then move forward with people who meet that criteria. And if it has to be done when I'm out of office. So be it, but I want to set the ball in motion to at least move this thing along so that we're not waiting another five years and say, oh, we missed that opportunity. Let's look at something new. Um, this, is, this is a bird in the hand and I hope we don't let it fly away. So I'll, I'm, I'm changing that motion to discuss the criteria. Okay. Uh, if that's okay with uh, uh, council member Davis, the, our seconder. Sure, I think I, I still I'm sensitive to the fact that staff doesn't have a lot of time between now and the 15th. So I still would say, you know, with the with the addition of Nora's memo, city attorney's office has has agreed to do an additional memo. I don't think we need more. Um, I don't think we need another memo from housing beyond what we have here for the full council to to weigh in. Thank you. Certainly. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I, I do agree. feel like they like. <laughs> I guess from the housing department's uh, perspective, I was struggling when the mayor said to uh, actually when Council Member Jones said, "Jackie, what would you include in a term sheet?" And I'm thinking, "Gosh, what would I like?" I'd have to really think through it. So my only concern is you guys are going to have discussion on criteria without even kind of understanding what because this memo wasn't written regarding like what are the issues one would want to negotiate on or would be important when you're thinking of implementation um so i'm challenged with understanding how that conversation would happen without staff taking a stab at at least providing more detail because like i said i'm a i'm a housing professional and I had a hard time just spitting it out right off the top of my head, but. Well, Jack, let, let me try to make it a little easier. Um, I'll try to be transparent. Uh, I was planning on putting a, working on a memo and Councilman Camus and I talked about it, where, for example, it would be a very general set of terms, where if we look, for example, on page eight, where you're talking about property management and condition, um, that it says staff recommends that properties bond regulatory agreements include provisions that require good maintenance of the property and will allow city's right to enforce safe property conditions in cases of mismanagement or the property falls into disrepair. So we basically let that right out of your memo and then say, well, look, you guys have funded tens of thousands of affordable units in this city and you've got conditions on that funding around management and maintenance and I'm not saying it's all cut and paste. Lord knows, I know there's thinking it goes into this stuff, but I'm venturing to guess the agreements that you've struck on funding in the last year are probably an awful lot of the same language that you struck in 2009. So, you know, again, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to minimize the amount of work here because I understand there's a lot, but I think at the very least, we could set some general parameters that can narrow our focus and that's, all I'm really looking to do. And if people don't want to be subjected to 
you know, property maintenance requirements and there's APA, then hopefully that means there's less stuff that you guys have to look at. Uh, Councilor Camus, I'm sorry, did you have your hand up? No, Mayor, I, I, I just wanted to change the motion and, and I agree. I think um, the, the staff has actually outlined eight pages worth of things that we can actually include in, um, in the criteria. And, and that's where I'm heading with you. Um, I, you know, I think that they, they, they rightfully brought up some ideas on making sure that uh, people um, at the lower end of the you know, AMI uh, be afforded the opportunity to, for housing. I agree with that. Um, I think they brought up a lot of great points already, things that are worth putting on paper and, and going forward with. And, I, and, I, and quite frankly, they've done a lot of the work already is what I'm trying to say. They've, they've already done this body of work. Okay. Uh, any other comments, questions? Yep. I, I, I want to make one last comment, and that is whenever we vote to approve this, whether it's this year or next year, we'll make sure that Council Member Cavus is there to do a victory lap. <laughs> I don't think that's it, but I understand. All right, uh, let's vote. Marinas? No. Davis? Aye. Emmis? Aye. Jones? No. Ricardo. Aye. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll move forward then to yeah, um, H2, which is an update to Neighborhood Services and Education Committee work plan. Motion to approve. Second. Mr. Beekman. Hi, um, thanks for the work on that last item. That was a good lesson in civics, thank you. Um, for this item, I wanted to kind of uh, try one more time to clarify a bit, a few words about uh, uh, small business situations into the next few years. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that NSC is gonna talk about those sort of things and um, you know, it was stated earlier about helping, you know, the small business task force in the downtown area. And I wanted to just try to offer um, as best I could one more time, the idea that, um, you know, what Ash Kara and David Chu and others assembly persons at the state level, what they have to go through right now. I mean, they're, they're balancing, you know, ideas from, from different parts of the political spectrum, uh, all parts of the political spectrum. And it's interesting way to work. They're actually working to compromise, you know, all the uh, sides of issues. And, you know, I, I, and I think they're, they're coming up with some really good ideas as a lot of people from Alameda County are as well. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it's their work and effort that uh, it's, it's unique. It, it is trying to build uh, you know, relationships and understanding. And uh, I, I find it really interesting to try to bridge the divides that we all face in the opposite part, political parties of each other and how they come up with their own creative ideas. And the work that people like Oscar are doing to bridge that is uh, fairly remarkable. And uh, so I wanted to note that at this time and, and how we all can try to move forward together and in our issues in this life and uh, it's tough work. So thank you. Thank you. All right, on the motion, let's vote. Marinas? Aye. Davis? Aye. Amos? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, for open forum, uh, first one with the phone number ending 5140. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. We can hear you, sir. Okay, good. Good. Yeah, I mean, you know, you want to get this economy rolling again, 
California and the world, start opening up businesses and stop listening to people like London Breed, Sam Liccardo, Gavin Newsom, probably the worst governor we've we've ever had, and uh, start getting the businesses open, open, close, open. It's not working. How are we going to generate all these fees and revenues and everything to be able to fund the city? It's going to be imp- it's going to be impossible. These next six months, I think you guys are going to have a come to Jesus moment that you're not going to believe. You start doing the numbers and all these programs that you want for everybody, millions and millions of dollars for everything, and five million dollars for tasers for San Jose PD. They don't even know how to they don't even know how to use a pen. I can't imagine what it's like when they use a firearm. These people. You know, they can't even use a pen to write a ticket because I've seen it happen personally. But that's another story. I mean, we got crime in my neighborhood. We got the helicopter out today again. Uh, home break ins, home invasions. But meanwhile, you guys talk about these pie in the sky ideas. You're losing your minds. You guys are doubling and tripling down on bad decisions. You need to get back to real government. You need to you need to get these businesses back open, and you need to reform the police department so we've ha- we have ov- overnight uh, patrols, so we don't have people breaking into the homes of eighty year old, eighty five year old women. You, this city should be ashamed of itself. Millions of dollars for the homeless, but God forbid you put a penny into some o- o- overnight shifts. I know that the captain in my area is trying to do this, but she doesn't she doesn't handle the budget. City council does. The, the the police chief does. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, it is time to consider a more open community practice for the future of San Jose community energy. Uh, from this, a process needs to begin to allow better public access for the San Jose Clean Energy Commission. In fact, the process needs to develop for all of the city commissions of San Jose to consider the ideas of better public input and review. In wanting to always consider uh, better public meeting ideas, can video public meeting minutes or simple written minutes of San Jose Commission meetings eventually be uh, made more available to the everyday public? And to conclude, a new US president elect has bought has bought, has brought some interesting new ideas of healing and good reasoning nationally that can be of much help to the local level at this time. As there was uncomfortable accusatory thoughts and ideas brought out in the fall San Jose election campaign. Meanwhile, Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors went through serious humanistic deliberations and careful thought to reach important decisions by June 2019 on the retainer process for jailed undocumented and how to interpret the Values Act. These decent attentions of the Board of Supervisors may simply be something of a standard bearer for the future of this country and for the border regions of this earth. I hope Mayor Licardo can learn to frame his his few important ideas and words on this subject more in the context of the incredibly decent-minded good work by Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors and more within the context of the human rights, civil protections, and immigrant rights ideas that is always doing important work here in San Jose and Santa Clara County. To conclude, as we are at a time to build a more healthy, open immigration system that we can all share and be a part of uh, in the future. And we are at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Needs adjourned.